Okay. So let's keep trucking here. So as of right now, we have the ability to add things to the end, or sorry, to the front of our list, uh, and then display the contents of our list. Well, displaying the content should work regardless. What if we wanted to add something to the end of our list rather than the front? So for example, if this is what my list currently looks like, that is head pointing to a node five, five pointing to a node two, two pointing to null, and I wanna add a brand new node, maybe it's a seven, I want seven to ultimately get added to the very end of my list. How would we do that? As you said, we have to point it to the number two. Well, oh, no, number five, yeah. we need to walk our list, traverse our entire list until we get to the end of the list. How do we know we're at the end of our list? If we're looking at this picture here, we know that two is the end of the list, right? What's the litmus test to determine that two is the end of the list? How do we know that two is the end of the list? It points to nothing. Two's next node is null. So we know that that's the end of the list, correct? So if we're gonna write the code to add a brand new element, brand new node to the end of the list, we need to first traverse our list till we get to the end. So we're gonna start cur node pointing to the same place head points to. We're gonna say, does cur node have a next node? It does. Cur node currently points to five, five does have a next node. So since it does have a next node, we're gonna set cur node equal to cur node's next node. Then we're gonna say again, does cur node have a next node? It does not. Cur node's next node is null. So we are now pointing at the end of the list. So the very first thing we need to do is we need to spin through making cur node point to the last node in our list. So we'll write public void add end. We're gonna still create a new node. Okay, then what if our list is empty? If we're dealing with the empty list, is adding to the end any different than adding to the front? No, you just do add front. You just call add front. So what we're actually gonna do is I'm gonna take this line here. I'm gonna delete it just for a second. If head is equal to null, then we'll say this dot add front value. We'll call upon the ability we've already written. Okay, because add front goes ahead and creates a note for us. Otherwise, if we're not dealing with the empty list, then we're gonna go ahead and create our new node then we're gonna create a node pointer. We'll call it cur node. We'll start this guy off at head. We'll say while cur node dot get next node is not equal to null. As long as cur node has a next node, we'll set cur node equal to cur node dot get next node. So that should walk cur node to the last node in our list. This little loop right here. Okay? That should take cur node from here to here to here. Okay? 
Now, once I'm here, how do we add it to the end of the list? Well, we say kernode.set next node equal to n. We set his next node to something new. And what does that effectively do? Kern node traverses here, then we set that guy's next node to the guy we just created. Make sense? To test that, ll.add end 7, ll.display. Now it should display 5 to 7, since the 7 should be at the end. 5 to 7. That makes sense? Didn't seem so bad, did it? Okay. Let's take a break from adding for a second and let's talk about removing. Notice I'm avoiding the hard part, adding and removing in the middle. Come back and deal with that in a little bit. Let's say I want to remove from the front. That is, I want to get the node 5, and I want to remove it from the front of the list, so it's no longer in the list. We can have it return the value if we want, it doesn't really matter. Um, but ultimately, we want the new head of the list to be there. How would I do that? So this is our this is our canvas currently. And I want to make five no longer in the list. So I want to make the new front of the list to be two. We have to check if um as is pointing to null if it's an empty list or not really since we already know that we want to remove something. Well, what if you ask to remove something from the front of the list? Well we'd be stupid enough. Well, let's let's go this route. Go this route. I see your point. Public. No, no, just no, oh. wasting time. I this isn't wasting time because I'm gonna have this guy return a value. <laughs> 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 so <just> chill. <laughs> so public node. We're gonna say remove front. So this guy is always gonna return a node. Okay. Nodes can be null. So. He's always going to return whatever head currently points to, correct? So if my list looks like this, the guy I'm going to return from this will be the five. If my list looks like this, that is the empty list, it'll return null, okay? So it's always going to return something, even if it's the null value. You want the front of an empty list? Here's nothing. Have fun with this. Okay, so you put, at least we're giving consistent behavior on, add, on, on remove front. And we're leaving it up to the programmer who's calling it to do the appropriate thing based on if they get a null value or not a null value, that type of thing. Okay, so we're going to say that our remove front always returns a node. And then we can do what we want with that node. All right, so no matter what else happens, the value we will always return will be the value of head. Make sense? So that makes it really easy to get the value that we're going to ultimately return. We can't return it right away because we need to do the you know, easy stuff of removing it. <laughs> but we know what we're going to actually return. So right off the bat, we're going to say node, node to return is equal to head. And we're going to hold on to that for later because later on at the very end, we're going to say return node to return at the very bottom. But we need to do some crap here in the middle. Okay? So now we've preserved the node to return. So I'll go ahead and write that. This is node to return. Like that. So both of these guys point to the same place. 
which means now I could change head and not lose track of this guy. Mm -hmm. That makes sense? Because this guy's this guy's pointer count is currently two. So we want to start thinking like pointers pretty often. Okay. Now, in order, ultimately, we want head to now point here. That's the next thing we want to have happen, right? How do we make head point to here? Let me say that programmatically. How do we make that move? Am I saying I want head to now be equal to head's next node? Head points here right now. This guy's next node is the guy we want head to ultimately point to. That make sense? So we're going to say head is equal to head dot get next node. Make sense? So that makes it look like this. Now, what do we do with this pointer? Do we want this guy to still be pointing up here? That could cause problems. Because later on, we don't know what the person who's getting node to return is going to do with it. He might preserve it and keep it alive forever, or he might immediately throw it away and let automatic garbage collection come and get it, right? We need to be careful, though, because right now we have a pointer that points to this guy. Now, when we remove this node from the list, he should no longer be part of the list in any way, correct? So we need to take this next node and set it to null. Oh. Make sense? Mm -hmm. We want to literally disconnect him from the list. So we're going to say node to return dot set next node to null. That disconnects him. Now, head points to the new front of the list, and then the rest of the list is still intact. You know, we can. We're just going to assume the list isn't screwed up from some other mistake. But as far as right now goes, we're pointing to the front of the list. Node to return has been completely disconnected. Its counter is now one, right? Because the only thing pointing to this is node to return. And now I can return node to return. Make sense? Now interesting question here. When we return node to return, what happens to this pointer counter? What happens to node to return when this method ends? Let me show you both sides of this. We're going to say node temp is equal to ll.remove front. Okay? ll.remove front is ultimately going to return a node. That's what this guy does. He returns a node, right? Mm -hmm. The node he returns is the node that node to return points to. At the end of this method, node to return, which was a local variable inside this method, it dies, right? I'm returning a value here. What's the value of node to return? When we're running this, that's going to resolve to a value. What kind of value is that? Why is it not a memory address? There'll be no, because it's like uh, node to return is equal to add. Here's node to return, right? Does this guy look like null to you? What is this? What is this guy? What kind of animal is he? Cat, dog, or null? 
or cat dog null or node? It's a node. So if I return the value of a node, what's the value of a node? If I just take a node, and I, node n equals new node 7, and then I print out n, what will it print out? Node n equals new node 7, system.out.println n. It's going to print out crazy memory address. Why? n's value is whatever is returned by the new keyword. This guy's a memory address. Correct? Node to return currently points... I mean, the fact that it's a pointer should say it's a memory address, right? This guy points into memory where this node lives. The value of that node is a memory address. That memory address contains collection, a collection of information. At the end of this method, remove front, before this return statement can finish, Java is going to resolve this variable, node to return. Okay, it's going to resolve that variable to its value. And its value is going to be a memory address. So what's actually going to return here is the memory address contained inside of node to return. At the end of this method, node to return is dead. Okay? No longer exists when this method is done. So what happens here? At the end of this method, this dude will drop to zero. Because node to return no longer points there. But we have a receiving end here. Over here in driver, I have a node temp that I created. And that guy is catching whatever value is flying out of remove front. So that means I have another variable here called temp. It lives in an entirely different context, a whole different scope. This is out inside the main method, inside of driver. But he is a pointer. That will point here. So at some point in the middle, there are actually two pointers that point to this one memory address. Temp, which lives inside of the scope that is the main method inside of driver and node to return, which lives and dies with the remove front method. So as soon as that method's done, temp gets this pointer, node to return dies off, which makes this guy drop back down to one. Does that make sense? So this node is preserved inside of a variable called temp that we defined right here. See how those pointers are getting passed around? Very, 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 very important that we start thinking like memory or thinking about memory because we cannot let things drop off. And more importantly, we now have to be good stewards with memory. For instance, we did a good thing by not running into problems in the future by leaving that connected. We could have returned this and still had this node connected up here. But at some later point in time, we may have thought, oh, that guy will get automatic garbage collected. But he won't because something still points to him. Does that make sense? So we need to make sure now that we're thinking about memory that we're cleaning up our own mess. Okay? Very important. Uh, you will find it extremely beneficial as you work through your homework assignments and stuff like that in here to always draw pictures. Okay, I know I told you to do that in the previous semester and you didn't listen. It's 10 times more important in this class because we're always working with memory. Okay. Uh, 
All right, so after we remove front, I should be able to do ll.display. We should see here's the 2, 5, 2, 5, 2, 7, and then we removed the 5, so now we just have 2, 7. The 5 still lives here in temp. System.out.println. Um, here, let's just teach nodes how to display themselves real quick. So I went into node, we're going to create a public void display system.out.println this.payload. Good enough. So after we removed it, we can just say temp.display and we should see our five. There's the guy we removed. Does that make sense? Okay, so that's remove front. Well, what about remove end? So if I want to remove end, that's the guy I want to remove, right? How do I remove from the end? This gets a little bit trickier. First of all, I need to traverse my list. to get to the node that we ultimately want to return, right? The node that I want to return is which node? I'm going to start off at head. How do I know I'm at the end node? I'm at the node whose next node is null, right? So I need to walk through to set node to return to point to the last node. Let's do that first. Go into link list. Public node remove end. Node to return will start off as head, the front of the list, but then we need to walk the list until this guy finally points, well, finally has a next node that's null. So while node to return dot get next node is not equal to null, set node to return equal to his own next node. After this while loop's done, Node to return should point to the last node in our list, that is the node whose next node is null. Okay? So this is the guy that we're ultimately going to return. So just like before, we can write down here, return, node to return. But we have to do some crap in the middle before we can just return him. We're going to disconnect some stuff, right? We need this guy to point to nothing, correct? So we need to now tra traverse our list again to get to the node whose next node is node to return. Does that make sense? So we need to walk through our list, starting with head, until we finally get to a node whose next node is equal to node to return. So we're going to create a node, cur node. We'll start this guy off at head, the beginning of the list. While cur node dot get next node is not equal to node to return. As long as we are not currently pointing at, as long as our next node is not the node that we're ultimately going to return, set cur node equal to cur node dot get next node. Okay, and what will that do? That's going to create a variable here called cur node. 
Kernode's going to have a pointer. Oh, hello. We're going to start him off pointing at the same thing that head points to. And then we're going to say, set Kerr node equal to his own next node as long as Kerr node's next node is not node to return. Right off the bat in this little example, Kerr node's next node is node to return. Correct? Remember, while loops are pre-check loops. So the very first time through here in our little example, this will be false. It already points to the right place. Okay? So cur node, after that while loop, points to the correct place. So what do we want to do? We want to set cur node's next node to null. Cur node dot set next node to null. Okay, now, let me steal this counter here. The pointer count for this node right here right now is two, correct? There are two separate pointers that point to this guy. Do I need to worry about that? Or will it naturally go down to one? At the end of remove end, any variable that we created as local variables here, for instance, cur node, which is a local variable, will die. So this pointer right here, this guy, when this method is over, this guy will disappear. And that will go down to one. We don't have to do anything special. It will just happen. Java will reclaim that variable in any memory associated with it. Okay? So that's what our list will look like then. Node to return looks like this. Is it properly disconnected? Looks like it. So we should be able to just return node to return. That should be remove end. So let's go ahead and test remove end. I won't capture the pointer anywhere. I'll just let it go into oblivion. I didn't display it again. So there's our 2, 5, 2, 5, 2, 7. Then we removed from the front, so the 5 is gone, so we just have 2, 7. Then we removed from the end, so the 7 is gone, so we just have 2. What if I try to uh, move my Legos off to the side here? What if I was dealing with a situation like this? We're dealing with the one list. I want to remove from the end. Node to return is pointing at something whose next node is null. Correct? So node to return is already where we want it. Then, you go back into node or link list for a second. I have a typo and I can't find it. Well, this code doesn't work currently, anyways. No, but like it's it's different than your result. Okay. I get like a random something else in the middle of it. Come on. Well, we're about to change this, anyways. All right. Just kidding. So node to return points here. That is, it points to the place where the next node is not equal to is equal to null. Correct? Mm -hmm. So right off the bat, node to return is now pointing to the correct place. Then what do we do with cur node? We start off cur node and we keep going as long as cur node's next node is zero. until it finally equals node to return. Cur node's first next node is null. He will never be equal to node to return. 
this code here breaks. The very first thing, get next node is not equal to node to return because the very first time it'll be equal to null. And what will we do? We'll set cur node equal to his own next node, which means that we just set cur node equal to nothing. Literally committed object objective suicide. <laughs> okay? He set himself equal to nothing. Then the very next time through, we're trying to call next node on nothingness. Let me show you what happens when you do that. You get a null pointer exception. So we're going to do ll.remove end to remove that last one where the problem fails us, right? And we get a null pointer exception. It's like, wait a minute. You tried to call get next node on something that doesn't exist. Can't do that. So, how do we make this work? We know that our code, remove end, works on two lists or bigger, correct? But it does not work on one lists. What about a zero list? If we're dealing with the empty list, we're just going to return null, correct? So that's an easy one to deal with, right? But what about one lists? How do we deal with one lists? Our logic currently breaks if we have a one list. We have a one list, and we just want to make it have the head print to nothing, like, right? Mm-hmm. Can't we just... Um, well, you could do that, I guess, but why not just disconnect stuff? Well, let me ask the first question, though. How do we detect that we have a one list? Okay, what would the if statement say? If I'm looking at this, how do I know we have a one list? There's nothing on the next pointer. Who's next? Head? No. We know we have a one list if head is not equal to null yeah. and head's next node is equal to null. Yeah, that's one. Right? So we need to have a couple of different questions here. Remove end. First thing we ask if head is equal to null, return head. It's the empty list. Both my front and my end are both nothing, because I have nothing in this list. Else if. If I'm in this else, I know that head is not equal to null. If head dot get next node is equal to null, then I'm dealing with a one list. If I'm dealing with a one list, I'm ultimately going to return the head. So I'm going to say node to return. Put that guy back at the top, like we had him before, is equal to head. I'm ultimately going to return node to return down at the very bottom like we did here. Okay? But I need to do some disconnecting first. If I have the one list, ultimately I want head to look like that. I want to leave my list in a state where now it's the empty list. Does that make sense? And how do I do that? By setting head equal to null. Head is equal to null. Else. If it's the empty list, return null. If head's next node is null, that means it's the one list, set head to null, 
ultimately we're going to return node to return, which was head. Correct? Otherwise, we're going to do all the magic we did originally. I need to do one more display. So after we removed end that last time, I need to do ll.display and it should say empty list now. Okay. What if I say remove front? Remove front already, already works for one list. Let's look at remove front. Node to return is head. We're going to set head equal to head's next node. Well, head's next node is in the one list is null. Then we're going to set node to returns, next node to null, and then return node to return. What if we were trying to move from the front from the empty list? No pointer exception. Why? Because what did I try to do? When we're dealing with the empty list, right here, I'm setting head equal to head's next node. Well, if head is null, I'm trying to pass nothing. I'm trying to call the method get next node on something that doesn't exist. Does that make sense? This guy does not exist. Therefore, you cannot call methods with him. So we need to have an if statement if head is equal to null, return head, or return null, whatever. Otherwise, we can do all this crap. So remove front already works for one lists. It already works for two lists and bigger, but it did not work for empty lists because we started trying to call methods on our empty list. Make sense? So now this guy should work. What about remove end? That should be plenty of times to completely empty our list out. More than enough. So remove end works because we already have it taking in the empty list into account. So now we can add to the front, add to the end, remove from the front, remove from the end. Can we add end on the empty list? Two is at the end now. Five, two, seven, two, seven. Looks like it. Add to the front, add to the end, remove from the front, remove from the end. That's what our list currently does. Okay, questions about any of that? Because now things are going to get really entertaining. What about adding in the middle? Adding at an index. For instance, if we have an array and we say we want bucket five of that array to now be seven, okay, to now hold the value seven, we're going to go to bucket five and change its value, whatever its current, current value, to seven. With linked lists, we are adding an element into our list. So if my list currently looks like, let's see, can we myself a three bucket array again, three bucket list. 
Okay, there we go. Okay, so let's say I have this list. And I'm going to go through and I'm going to quickly index these. And we're going to make it a zero-based index just like arrays are. So that's bucket zero. That's bucket one. That's bucket two. Okay. And let's say that we want to add something at index one. That means, so let's say we have a new node. Let's say this guy's gonna be a 13. We want this guy to become the new bucket one. Okay, so that means that what we ultimately want to happen is we want this guy to be a one and everything after him to be two, then three. So ultimately, we're going to insert it there. So we want to insert it before what's currently at bucket one. That make sense? All right. So well, let's go back like this. All right. So add at index is what we're going to call this guy. called it uh, value, I think before, right? Yeah, int value. This guy's going to take two parameters, the value we want to add and the index that we're adding him to. Okay. Right off the bat, we want to make sure that this guy is a legal index. Correct? If the index is less than zero, that's illegal, right? What if it's greater than the number of elements in the list? If we deal with an array, the array has five buckets in it. If we want to add to bucket zero, one, two, so we have three elements in this. Let's say we said we wanted to add it at bucket two. It would come before this guy, right? What if we said we wanted to add it at bucket three? Hmm? Okay, so adding at bucket three should mean it goes at the end of the list. What if I say bucket nine? Well, should bucket nine be an error because bucket nine does not exist? Bucket three says add to the end, correct? Because we're going to add it before bucket three, but we'll be after bucket two. So that means add to the end. We've already solved that problem. But in order to do that, so we can say less than zero is not allowed. So add at bucket zero says we're going to add it before this guy. That's add front, correct? Add at. 3 is add end. But in order to know that, we need to be able to ask our list how many elements are there currently in the list. How do we do that? So we, we can write that. So public int. Oh, you always think it's humor. We need to have a way of asking our list how long it is. I thought there was actually a built-in thing already. And I yeah, built-in. Everything we have here, we wrote. Okay. Okay. All right, so int, make it public. We want this method to return the number of elements in our list. How do we do that? How many elements are in this list currently? It can be a while and then it can walk through and then Three. after you go through you can add some add to like So like count them. Yeah. So we'll start off the head. Is this guy 
Null? Nope. So we have one. Is this guy null? Nope. Two. Is this guy null? Nope. Three. Is this guy null? Yes. Done. Return three. So we'll start from the current node off at the front of the list, start a count off at zero. Each time through, we'll increment count, and we'll say cur node is equal to cur node dot get next node. And we should protect ourselves from a uh, uh, null pointer exception because we're never getting inside this loop while cur node is currently equal to null. Then at the end, return count. And that's length. Now, let's come out here. We'll go ahead and add some things. We'll add a 2 to the end, a 5 to the front, a 7 to the end, and then we'll print out the length. Length should be 3, right? Okay. What if we ll.remove end? Length should now be 2. ll.remove front should now be 1. LL dot remove end so now be zero. Remove end again, still zero. All right. Does length work? What's wrong with it? I agree it works. Huh? Something pointing somewhere extra. Um, yep. The only thing it works with is a local variable current oath that should die at the very end of this method. No, this is just inefficient. Horribly, horribly inefficient. Why? Every single time I ask for the length of my link list. It's going through and it's literally calculating the length of the link list by walking the entire list. Yeah. Do we need to do that? Or not yet. I don't know how else to do it. All right, so let me ask you this. So we have a bunch of Legos on the floor. Okay, we got a bucket. It's time to pick up our Legos. Now, we pick up all the Legos, we throw them into the bucket. And I ask you, how many Legos are there? Doing it the way we're doing now, we dump out the bucket, we count the Legos. Yeah, how could you do it differently? <laughs> well, I don't see another way. You couldn't count as you're putting them into the bucket? You could do that, but you ask after you already put them in. Well, somebody might be interested. Is how many elements are in a list, is that something that we can, a reasonable person would say we might be interested in knowing? Don't we want to know how many elements are in an array? Yeah. Don't we want to know how many elements are in a string? So wouldn't it follow that we'd be very interested in knowing how many elements at a particular point in time are inside of a linked list? So how would we do it? How would I modify this code so that my length method doesn't suck? The equivalent of picking up those Legos and counting as we're putting them into the container. Every single time we add something to our list, 
we want to add to our count. Every single time we remove something from our list, we want to subtract from our count. So we count a big variable. I mean, like a global. Global variable, right? So we'll make it a field. So count will be a private integer associated with a linked list. When we first create our linked list, count will be equal to zero. Nothing's in it. Okay. For removing from the end. Did anything actually get removed here if head is equal to null? No. The only thing time something gets removed is either if we have the one list or we have a two or greater list. So we'll say count minus minus before node to return. Remove front. Again, nothing gets returned there. Count minus minus. Add front. Does something get added here? Yeah. If it's the empty list, it just becomes, we now have the one list, right? Does something get added here? Yep. So it doesn't matter which of these we get into, we're going to say count plus plus. Something always gets added when we add to the front. If we add to the end, something always gets added. Right? But I just introduced a bug. What bug did I introduce here? And tell me why. It involves what's happening right in there. Why have I introduced a bug? Head would be counted as, as zero, as positive. What does add front do? Oh, it adds one to that, and then you're adding one in here to the front. When I add something to the end, I'll count it twice when I add it to the empty list. Does that make sense? Because add front increments count, and add end also increments count. So I only want to increment count if I'm inside this else. Because if I call add front, the count will automatically get incremented. That makes sense? Okay. So things like that we need to be careful of. So now I have all my add methods, well, my add front, add end, remove front, remove end, appropriately changing count. So now all length needs to do is return this dot count. Now length is not calculated. Length changes as I add and remove things. I don't have to calculate it every single time I call length. There we have our three. If I remove one thing, we have our two, so on and so forth. Move front, we have our one. Okay, so length is now a piece of information we're keeping track of as a field within our linked list. Okay? Now, we're back to added index. We decided that they can give us an index of zero. 
That's legal. They give us a zero index, we'll add it to the front. If they give us an index equal to the length, we'll add it to the end. But if they give us an index less than zero, that's illegal. If they give us an index greater than the length, that's illegal. And we want to give them some sort of error. Okay? So we're going to say, if index is less than zero, or index is greater than this dot length, what's this in this particular case? Who is this? This gets back to the definition of the this keyword. This should be very fresh in the memory of anybody who just took 535. And really, it should be fresh in everybody's mind because you've been practicing your programming. Where if you tell us it's another memory address, though? Well, it will be a memory address. That's what its value will be. But tell me what you, tell me what you know about this. What is the this keyword? This one is side. Hmm? The, the one inside of that cell. That's not the other guy. Is it like the one in that class thing? Well, I'm pretty sure you're saying the right thing. You're just saying it terribly. Yeah. This is how an instance of an object refers to itself. That's what I meant to say. So inside of here, we are inside of the linked list class. So this is this particular instance of linked list. So when I say this dot length, what I'm saying is call my length method. And what does my length method do? It just checks my count field. So saying this dot length is the same thing as saying this dot count. Does that make sense? So if my index is less than zero or the index is greater than my length, we have an error. Now, we're going to deal with some exceptions. Did we do exceptions in the 535 class recently? Sometimes I do them, sometimes I don't. Who remembers exceptions that I taught you? All right, so let's just assume now. We've seen some exceptions in action today. We saw the null pointer exception. Anything we get in red, that's an exception. Well, it follows that we might want to have our own exceptions. So what we're going to do is we're going to say added index throws an exception. For right now, we're just going to use our own built-in generic exceptions. We're not going to write our own you know, uh, custom exception class. We're just going to use built-in exceptions to just create a quick little error message. Okay. So we say that added index does something called throws an exception. Something bad can happen when you call this method. And what this is doing, by saying this guy throws an exception, we are warning anybody who calls this method that you must be prepared for bad things to happen. So you must either put it inside of a try catch or pass the buck. We'll see that here in a second. If the index they gave us is in a legal position. We're going to throw a new exception linked list out of bounds exception. We'll put a little colon there. And then we'll go ahead and print out whatever index was. So if they passed in a negative four for the index we're adding it, this will say linked list out of bounds exception negative four. Screaming at them saying that's not a legal place. Okay. This is what happens when our the index we pass this is either smaller than zero or greater than the length of this linked list. Now let's test this real quick. So right now, my added index doesn't really do anything except throw exceptions. Okay, Very primitive added index that doesn't even do what it's supposed to do. But it allows us to look at exceptions for a few minutes. All right, so I'm going to go back into driver. 
And I'm going to try to say ll dot add at index. We're going to add a 13 at index negative 8. Now, right off the bat, notice that it's underlining it. Okay. Even if I said add at index 0, which is allowed, it's still underlining it. Why is it underlining it? It's telling us, if I highlight over this, it says unhandled exception. Because we wrote in our code over here, in link list, that this guy throws an exception, we've advertised that something bad can happen here. Therefore, out here in driver, when we're trying to call upon this guy, it's letting us know that. That look, something bad can happen. So you must either try to do this, Then catch the exception, so that's one way we can do this. So if I go ahead and run this, we just get something went wrong. We didn't get our beautiful link list out of bounds exception. Why? Because how does a try catch work? We are going to try to execute the code that's inside of this, mm -hmm. uh, this try. If anything goes wrong, we're going to catch that exception. And rather than just failing because of the exception, we're going to gracefully deal with it. Okay? Now I can print out the exception if I want. Instead of just saying something went wrong, I can do... Uh, here, we'll do print stack trace. Good enough. Oh, actually, we'll just print out E. I could say E or print out, or just say E dot print stack trace. Now this will give us our actual error message. Java dot line exception, link list out of bounds exception. But it's not in red. <laughs> so maybe instead of system dot out, we say system dot error. It's a different stream. There's our red. But if this is all you're going to do anyways, if this is all you're going to do, you're just going to catch the exception and just print it out, here's the cop-out way of doing it. This is the lazy programmer's way of doing it. Which I'm saying isn't necessarily wrong, but it is lazy. Inside main, we're going to say this guy throws exception. we can choose to pass the buck. So, notice it's not screaming at us anymore. Why? Because we've said that main throws an exception. Now, this is as high as it goes. The next level up from here is a Java virtual machine, a Java runtime environment. This is our last opportunity as a programmer to deal with any exceptions. If we pass the buck here, we're leaving it up to the Java virtual machine to deal with the exception however it's going to deal with the exception. And all he does is print, prints out the exception. So this, in this case, we're saying, look, I'm not going to deal with this exception anyway, so I'm going to pass the buck, and everything will be fine. I run it now. We get our exception. Same one we wrote. Link list, out of bounds, exception, blah, blah, blah. Okay. But understand that this is, a, this is a hierarchy. So if we had a method inside of a method inside of a method that threw an exception, and we wanted to take the lazy way out, we'd have to have each of those methods throw the exception up a level until we finally got up to main and have main throw the exception. Does that make sense? You don't just get to throw it once. You gotta keep passing the buck until it's no longer your problem, okay? So this would be the lazy way to handle it, but at least get this lets us see kind of some of the examples. Um, but make sure you're doing it for the right reason. In our example here, since we're not going to do anything because of it, we might just throw the exception. But let's say that we had an interactive program. 
where we're saying, please enter the index you'd like to add this node to. Okay? You're asking them for the value what they want to add and then the index they're going to add it to. If they give you a bad index, which you can determine by the fact that we got an exception, you might then choose to respond to that exception by asking them to give you the index again. Does that make sense? Rather than having it crash and show a bunch of red text to the screen, we can say, oh, you've given us a bad exception. Please try again. Read it again. Try again. Like in the checkers? Huh? Like in the checkers? Like in the checkers. You could have had to throw an exception in that case. Okay? So exception handling is our way of gracefully handling errors inside of our program, if we choose to. Or we can just pass the buck and not gracefully handle it. All right? So... We see our exception thing seems to work. So if they've given us something out of bounds, we're going to yell about it. Else if index is equal to zero. What are we going to do? We're going to add to the front. Correct? So we'll say this dot add front value. Else if index is equal to this dot length, this dot add end value, else we must be adding somewhere in the middle. That makes sense? Now if we're adding somewhere in the middle, just so we don't forget, we're going to have a count plus plus somewhere in here. Probably at the very end, but somewhere in there. We didn't have it in these two because these guys already do the count plus plus. Okay. Make sense? Add front and add end, they already account for that we just added something. They increment count. So we're only going to increment count ourselves here if we're adding somewhere in the middle. All right, so what does this guy currently do? If we're adding... Below zero, something less than zero, error. Something greater than three, error. Adding at zero, just call add front. Adding at length, call add end. Otherwise, we're adding somewhere in the middle. <laughs> okay, so if we're adding at one, let's say. So we know we're adding somewhere between one and length minus one. If we're still kicking, we're adding somewhere, we're either adding here or we're adding here. That make sense? And adding here means that we want our node to come before this guy. We want him to become the new bucket two. We want our new node to become the new bucket one. Okay? So if we're adding a 13 at bucket one, how do we do that? Well, the first thing is we'll create our node. Okay? Let's go do that. Node n is equal to new node value. Now our node exists. Okay, and as of right now, that node has a next pointer that points nowhere. Okay, so that's what he looks like right now. All right, now we need to figure out where this guy is ultimately going to be. So we're going to need a Another variable, we'll call it cur node for right now. We're going to set cur node at head, and we're going to spin through one time to get to bucket one. So index number of times. So we're going to set cur node equal to cur node's next node index number of times. So that cur node will point there. Okay. That makes sense? Mm -hmm. If I do that once, if index is one, doing that one time, cur node will point to the, the guy that's going to be, the guy we're replacing, if you will, the guy we're coming before. If we do it two, if we're adding it to index two, cur node would point there. 
So we're going to say node per node is equal to head. For int i is equal to 0. i is less than index. i plus plus per node is equal to per node dot get next node. Okay. Now, this is actually a good example of while loops versus for loops. If you go back to the 535 class, when we day one of class, I think, when we talked about loops, we said there's three kinds of loops. For loops, while loops, do while loops. Do while loops are the, they're the different kid, right? They're the ones that, shh, you guys working on this class, you're working in your other class. <laughs> so at the very least, keep your babble down to a minimum. <laughs> All right, so if you, uh, um, a, a do while loop does something at least one time, right? Okay, so that one kind of throws the, okay, but for loops and while loops. While loops lend themselves to problems where you do not know how many times it needs to spin. Okay, we're going to do something for a certain amount of time. We've already seen that several times. Keep moving to the next node until we finally hit a node whose next node is null. That might be two spins, that might be 40 spins, right? We don't know. In this case, we know exactly how many times we need to spin through our list. We need to go through index number of times. That's going to be the guy that we're going to put our new node right before. That's why we chose the for loop. We know how many times we need to go through here. We need to go through index number of times. Okay? So, that's what this loop will do. That'll set cur node pointing to the right place. Now, ultimately, we want this guy to come before this guy. So what does that mean? We want our new node's next node to point to the same place as cur node points to. Does that make sense? Because this guy's going to come right before this guy. So we can go ahead and do that. So we're going to say n dot set next node to cur node. N dot set next node to the same place cur node points to. So they're both pointing to the same place now. Make sense? Hopefully you're seeing how helpful drawing pictures is. This would be a lot more difficult if we were trying to conceptualize the entire thing in our head. Okay? Now what do we need to do? Well now, we need the guy right before cur node to point to n. Well, how do we get this guy? We're going to need another loop. So we're going to need a node, prev node, starts off as head, while prev node dot get next node is not equal to cur node prev node dot or prev node equals prev node dot get next node okay so we created another variable called him prev node Started him pointing at the same place head pointed to. And then we want to keep going as long as prev node, next node, is not equal to cur node. But in this case, prev node's next node is equal to cur node, right off the bat, right? So prev node currently points to the node that's immediately before cur node. So now we want to set prev node's next node equal to n. Make sense? Prev node dot set next node to n. Okay, anything else we need to do? Or we have we surgically implanted <laughs> the, the node in the correct place? Zero, 
one, two, three. So it's the new bucket one now, right? Okay, seem to work. Let's test it on two. So let's say we have another node. We know that zero will work because we handle it as a special case, correct? Otherwise, our, our generic algorithm would not work here. We handle zero as a special case. We handle three as a special case. So now we just need to make sure everything in the middle works out. So let's try doing it to two. So we're going to add a 15 at bucket two. So we create our node first. That's our 15. It's right here. Then we set current node equal to n. We spin two times. Current node is equal to head. Spin once. Spin twice. Um, actually, we're going to do it to bucket three because we've already added a guy here. Just so we can handle the deal with the guy at the end. So we're going to add it to bucket three. So we're going to start there, spin once, spin twice, spin three times. Now cur node points to the right place. Okay. Now we're going to set ends next node point to the same place as cur node. N set next node to cur node. That's N. We're going to have his next node point to the same place cur node points to. Then we're going to deal with our prev node. Prev node is going to start off at head, and we're going to walk our list until we finally get prev node into a position where his next node is cur node. So prev node will start right here. Is this guy's next node cur node? It's not. Let's move it here. Is this guy's next node cur node? Nope. So we're here. Is this guy's next node cur node? Yes. So we're done. So we move prev node into place. Then what do we do? We set prev node's next node to n. So this guy, his next node points to n. And then increment count. Does that add things correctly? So 5 goes to 13, goes to 2, goes to 15, goes to 7. Does that make sense? All right. Let's try one last one. That's adding somewhere kind of in the middle. Right now we kind of dealt with the extremities. The not the add front, not the add in, but add one in from those. Let's add somewhere in the center. This is three. This is four. Let's add to two. Okay. So we're going to add a eight. At bucket two. So we create our node. Cur node starts off here. Go once, go twice. Then we're going to set we're going to set n's next node to be the same thing as cur node points to. Then we're going to do previous node. Previous node is going to start off at head. We're going to keep going as long as previous node's next node is not equal to cur node. Is this guy's next node equal to cur node? Nope. Is this guy's next node equal to cur node? Yes. Stop. Then what are we going to do? We're going to set previous node's next node equal to n. Our list, head goes to here. 
to here, to here, to here, to here, to here. Seem to work? Okay, let's go test that. Let's just see our list here real quick. That's our current list, so five, two, seven. So let's go ahead and add a three at zero. We know that'll work because it'll add front, but let's just go through the motions, okay? So we're gonna say add at index a three at position zero. So we should get a three at the very beginning. Okay, and then we're going to say this is 0, 1, well, this is 1, 2, 3, 4. So let's add at 4. Okay, so this is 0, 1, 2, 3, 4 should add at end. So let's do a 10 at 4. And there's our 10 at the very end. Okay, now let's do a 4 at 1. So now it should say three, four, five. Three, four, five. Zero, one, two, three, four, five. Okay, so now let's do a eight at five. That should be seven, eight, ten. Is there 7, 8, 10? All right, so let's do 0, 1, 2, 3. So let's do a, um, six. a 6 at 3. So we should have 5, 6, 2. Uh, testing you. You were right on top of that one. Six at three. Five, six, two. Okay. So it seems to be working, adding things at specific index indices. All right. So that's added index. Now, what about add or remove at index? Well, If I say remove at index less than zero or greater than length, it's going to give us an error, right? And just like before. Public node remove at index. Why are we making all the removes nodes? Because they're removing, because they're ultimately returning the node that we're removing, this guy. You could, you could make an argument that we should re return the payload instead of the node itself. Like, here's the value we just removed. So well, it, you know the adding ones, you're not returning. What would we return if we added? Well, we're not, so why do we have to return? Well, if you reach into the bucket of Legos and you remove something, you have a Lego. Oh. But if you add into the bucket of Legos... You don't have anything to show for it, right? You just when put you, it. When you remove, you can't just like throw away the Lego. It has to. Well, you could. We're just giving ourselves the option. So, like for instance, out here, I mean, you absolutely could. Oh, it's not necessary. We're right. We're leaving it up to the programmer. Okay. So the programmer can choose to say node temp is equal to ll dot remove end, or they could just say ll dot remove front. And have that node that's firing out of here just disappear into oblivion. Okay. Yeah, so we're, we're empowering the programmer to decide if they'd like to do something with that 
dude they just removed. That will become very handy for us when we start building our add-on data structures to link lists like stacks and queues because they have functions built in with them that we expect a peak to do one thing. We expect a pop to do something else. We expect a push to do something else. And having that flexibility in here will be beneficial to us. All right, so remove at index, int index. And this guy is going to return a node. We're going to have him throw an exception. Just, yeah. Yep, because if you give us a negative number or you give us a number greater than length, we're going to yell at you. So we're going to steal this if statement here. So if the index you gave me is less than zero or the index you gave me is greater than length, Now, let me ask you this. If I say greater than length, let's say that we have a four bucket length list. Legal buckets are zero, one, two, and three. Let's say I say remove at index four. Does that even make sense? So in this case, it has to be greater than length minus one. Adding at length meant we wanted to add to the end. But when we remove something, we want to remove something that already exists. So we're only removing indices that are there. So if we have a linked list with length four, legal indices are zero to three. So if index is less than zero, or index is greater than length minus one, if either of those are true, we have an out of bounds exception. Make sense? Is greater than length minus one, why don't we just do greater than or equal to one? Greater than or equal to length. That that's not the same thing, is it? Yeah. Greater no. no just kidding. It would be greater than or equal to length minus two. Yeah, greater than, greater than length minus 1 is the same thing as greater than or equal to length minus 2. Okay. All right, so if you gave us a bad index, shame on you, scream at you. Else if index is equal to 0, return this dot remove front. And this guy knows how to do the count minus minus on his own. Else if index is equal to this dot length minus one, return this dot remove end. And this guy knows how to do the count minus minus on his own. Else. Remove somewhere in the middle. So we're going to have a count minus minus in here. <laughs> now, I'm trying to write these things in a very specific order so you kind of see how I go about writing programs. Um, this will help you. Now, first of all, as you're writing this stuff, you're going to run into a lot more mistakes than I run into. I already ran into all the mistakes. I've been doing this for a while. But if you notice how I write these things, I specifically point it out. I'm not just doing it for teaching purposes. I do this in my head too when I'm writing this stuff. I said, this guy already handles the count minus minus. This guy already handles the count minus minus. This is when we have to do it manually. Let's go ahead and put the count minus minus in right now so we don't forget it. That little factoid is something that we could very easily forget to throw in there after we just spent 45 minutes or, you know, in our case, probably be five or six minutes, whatever it's going to take to write the code that goes here. This would be a very easy thing to forget. So let's just throw it in there. We know we need it. That makes sense? Same thing as why I always put the opening and closing curly braces. Even if I, even if Eclipse didn't do it for me, I still always did that. Um, if I was writing this in notepad or something, because we know if we have an opening curly brace here, we are going to have a closing one. And some of the hardest problems to debug are when you have missing curly braces. And especially if you didn't indent very well, 
you might get confused on what's actually ending what. And then you have a program that's very difficult to debug. And then you get into this habit of randomly trying to put curly braces in or removing curly braces, and then all hell breaks loose. All right, so we have our count minus minus. So now we need to go and figure out through pictures, how do we remove one of these nodes? We know we didn't get a zero. We know we didn't get a four. We're somewhere in the middle, right? So let's say we want to remove the one. We want to remove the one. Let's go ahead and have cur node go to the guy we're going to remove. Okay, except I'm going to rename him node to return. Just to stay consistent with what we wrote before, all of our other um, uh, remove methods, we had a little node pointer in there called node to remove, or node to return, I think. So we're going to create a node pointer called node to return, and we'll start this guy off at head. And we'll have a little for loop for it i is equal to zero, i is less than index, i plus plus, node to return is equal to node to return dot get next node. Okay, so we'll have that guy quickly zip to the correct position. This is ultimately the guy that we're getting out of here, which means that we need this guy to point to this guy and this guy to point to nobody. Okay, we need to detach this dude from the list. Okay, then we have our prev node. And what's our prev node going to do? Our prev node is going to start off at head and walk until we have a next node that is node to return. Okay? Let me ask you a quick question. Because we did it last time, order didn't matter last time. Can I safely, before I deal with prev node, just to show you what I'm talking about here, when we did added index, we got cur node equal to a certain place, and then the very next thing we did is we set the next node. Can I safely disconnect this guy? I just lost access to this dude, right? Can't disconnect that yet. So again, things to be careful of, reason why you're right, drawing pictures. We have to preserve a pointer to this guy until we put a second pointer there. All right, so now we're going to set up prev node. Prev node's going to start off at head and keep going as long as prev node's next node is not cur node. So in this particular case, it's not going to do it at all. So we'll say node, prev node starts off at head while prev node dot get next node is not equal to node to return. I think I said cur node, but that's what it's called, node to return. So while prev node's next node is not equal to node to return, prev node is equal to prev node dot get next node. So we'll start off at head, prev node's next node is node to return. Okay, then what do we want to do? Then we want to set prev node's next node equal to node to return's next node. Prev node's next node equal to node to return's next node. Prev node dot set next node to node to return dot get next node. Set prev node's next node to node to return's get next node. This is prev node. Set his next node equal to node to return's get next node. So they both point to the same place. Okay, that would have been a very difficult line to write without the picture. But see how easy it was with the picture? You remember that when you don't draw pictures. Remember how much easier that line was to write, drawing the picture. Okay? Then, 
we can take node to return and set his next node to null. Now we can detach him. Make sense? Mm -hmm. Node to return dot set next node to null. Okay. And now we have successfully removed node to return. Our list is still in good shape here. Decrement count. And then ultimately return node to return. Make sense? Okay. So let's go ahead and test this. So right now, our thing looks like that. So let's remove it index zero. So we should have the, what are we used to have there, two? Two, yeah. Yeah, uh, we had a three there, so now we should start with a four. Remove it index zero, we have a four. Uh, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. Remove it 6. <laughs> Our list is getting too big. I can't remember. Okay, so we should have the 10 gone if I remove it 6. Okay, no more 10. Remove 6. Uh, th 3. 0, 1, 2, 3. So the 6 should go right to the 7. Six right to the seven. Uh, let's try a one. So four should go right to the six. Zero, one, two. Let's try it a two. So the six should go right to the eight. Cool. All right. So there is our call it a working, um, just for the sake of argument, quickly, ll dot length, I think it should be three at the end, right? Yep, seems to be updating correctly. We did a lot of removing in there. I think we're, we're pretty good there. All right, so questions about our singly linked list. This is a full implementation of a singly linked list. Okay, now, our homework assignment. I'm even going to be nice. <laughs> that's, that's, a, that's a great, because uh, the assignment's actually fairly difficult. I'm going to show you in a second, but just so I can, I need to, in order to be nice, I need to look at something real quick. Um, well, I'm going to provide you with the code we wrote in class today. That way you can focus on using linked lists rather than writing the linked list. Uh, that's right, you darn people. <laughs> Let's see, what am I doing here? Let's see. 
Eclipse workspace. This is what I'm looking for. 537. I should have her. Yeah, that's good enough. I'll just give you the whole source folder so it has all of our stuff in it. Okay. 537. Just so I don't forget here, I need to unlock the course so you guys can see it. No, that, I tested it. It doesn't work. <laughs> All right. So here's homework. And let me go ahead and let me add a link to the code here. That's not that one content link. Okay, so there's your source code. So using your own link list implementation, see attached, implement a class called huge integer that represents arbitrary sized integers and supports addition and multiplication. You may only use the tools we have introduced in class and you may not use Java's big integer class. So what I'm asking you to do is think about the limitations that we have with the integer and the long primitive types. So these are all integer types, not decimal places, just whole integers. A integer can only hold numbers between negative 2 billion and positive 2 billion. Longs can hold bigger numbers, but still not infinite numbers. Using a linked list, I want you to be able to represent an infinite size number. Now it will get slower as your numbers get big. Okay, so uh, understand that if you try to represent a number with, uh, um, you know, 10 trillion places in it, it's going to get slow. Not a big deal. The point is we're using linked lists to represent numbers that are arbitrary in size. Okay, can be as long can be as, uh, as huge of an integer as we want, hence the name huge integer. Your huge integer class should support adding huge integers together. So if you have one huge integer and you have another huge integer, you should be able to add those two together, producing another huge integer, which is the sum of those two. Does that make sense? Both huge integers are represented as linked lists. So you're going to have to go back and you're going to have to do addition per node with the carry bits. Oh, this is a nightmare. It's going to be so awesome. Okay. So one thing you'll have to add to our code is the ability to get a node at a particular index. Right now we have remove, but we might not want to remove it. We might want to just get it. So getting a node at a specific index is going to be very similar to remove, except we won't disconnect stuff. You'll just spin to where you want to get and say, here's the node that's at that position so that you can take this guy plus this guy, get the two payloads, add them together, decide, do I need to carry something? That make sense? All right. Similarly, it should work for multiplication. Only those two, addition and multiplication. No subtraction, no division. Um, this is hard, uh, but the difficulty isn't in the mathematics of it. Addition and multiplication are easy, right? Your difficulty is you're going to be working with a linked list. You're going to have to take the structure that we built in class today, 
add a little bit to it, but very little. That's why I'm giving you the code to start with. Okay, so you're struggling with the problem at hand, not building a linked list. But then you're going to have to solve the problem of doing manual addition and manual multiplication. All right, questions about that assignment? That should be a fun one. And by fun, I mean the worst parts of the Bible. Okay, so there's that. And then, as if that wasn't enough work, you also have a report. Because now all of our classes have a written component. Report number one. I did make it relatively short. Uh, because the programming is such a big one. Write a two to three page paper discussing the advantages and disadvantages of linked lists versus arrays. So pretty much take about the first 45 minutes of class today, along with some research you might do on your own, and come up with your own argument as when you should use each of those. Something I want you to focus on in this is understanding that linked lists are not the upgrade to arrays. Okay. Here, I'll even add that in here. Note that linked lists are not the upgrade to arrays. These two structures solve different problems. Discuss when each would be the right tool for the job. Make sense? All right. Questions about either of those? I will put this on the syllabus, but for those of you who... Um, Need to ask questions? Email. Or text. Are the two best ways to get a hold of me. If you text me, just make sure that I know who you are when you text me. I already got Habib, I think. Um, I don't know about some of the rest of you, but just the first time you text me, just... Say, yo, this is so-and-so from your 537 class. That way I can get you in my contacts. Uh, then ask your question. You can call me at this number two. There's about a 99% chance I will not answer. Mm -hmm. I don't answer if my mom calls. The only person I answer is if my wife calls because she knows not to call me. <laughs> so if she's calling me, it's an emergency. <laughs> in fact, if you've ever called my phone, my voice message actually says the best way to reach me is by text or email. I just don't do phone. It's, it's a thing. So deal with it. All right. True statement. Try to call my phone sometime. That's what my message says. <laughs> my grandpa doesn't do email or text, so he's out of luck. He has to go through my mom in order to contact me. So I don't even check my voicemail half the time. It's how about, terrible. How about if, if somebody calling you a really necessary person? The only person necessary calling me is my wife. How about, no, I mean... For a necessary job, or you tax tax return, IRS. They'll get the message. Send me an email. I tell them the email address. <laughs> you feel like my accountant is calling me, telling me I'm being sued for something. That's like an important thing. Well, you can email that to me. He also texts me. So <laughs> I, I've trained pretty much everybody in my life. <laughs> All right. Questions, comments, concerns, bribes. I'll see everybody next Monday, and I'll put up the link to the YouTube videos uh, tonight as well.